Well, I think the biggest challenge was that there were so many challenges all hitting us at the same time. Um, so first of all, there was the fact that, you know, this is just a very challenging undertaking programmatically. You know, the challenge of, you know, inspiring not just any college graduate, but the people who are really ready and able to make a real difference for kids to decide to do this and to make this choice. Um, and then to, to figure out how to train and support them so that they don't just survive their first and second years of teaching, but actually succeed with their kids and learn the lessons that come from success rather than lessons that come from failure, you know, so that they leave more committed and not more disillusioned about the possibility of affecting long-term change. So there were huge programmatic challenges um, and huge management challenges. I mean, I was 21 when I started off on this Teach for America journey, and within a year we had something like 60 staff members in six or seven offices, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I didn't want to worry about that either. Like, I, I didn't want to spend any energy on matters of management and organization, and that really came back to haunt us. Um, and, and at the same time, and, and maybe like the most existential of the challenges was just financial. You know, like we, we just really did not have the resources to do what we said we were going to do. And so I would spend every waking moment just trying to figure out how to get into doors of people who could solve that problem. You know, whether by donating funds as companies or foundations or individuals. Um, so yes, this, the, all, the combination of all of those things, and, and then also the politics of education. You know, we, we quickly built many allies in the communities where we were working, but at the same time, you know, what we're doing kind of runs up against traditional paradigms around how teachers are prepared and supported and licensed, and that generated its own set of, of challenges. So I think it was all of those things um, really confronting a very, very inexperienced team. So we spent a decade of just near-death experiences trying to figure out how to climb all these learning curves and, and how to stay afloat given the lack of financial resources. There were aspects of what we were doing that I just had total conviction about. You know, so the thing that most people didn't believe initially was that the college students would do this. I mean, they thought this was a great idea. We were, I was getting lots of positive feedback. I mean, this is brilliant. It's just they thought college students would never do it. And that was the thing where I actually had reason to be confident. So I really had a lot of conviction that this was gonna work. Um, at the same time, you know, I was surrounded by people who were helping to keep me going. You know, like I think the people on our team and, you know, again, the few people who, who were drawn to this, their support kept me going. And, and then finally, I think just a deep sense of responsibility. I mean, you know, as I got further and further in, it became harder and harder to kind of get out of it. <laughs> and I didn't really see the choice but to persevere. And I think that was, was part of it. That's such a good question. I, I guess I'm of two minds. I mean, one, I really do think we should all be thinking deeply at every juncture around our theory of change, you know, um, because there are limited resources in the world and we should be putting those limited resources towards the things that have the potential to have the biggest impact. And so if we're not thinking about not only how to put band-aids on the current problem, but how to actually solve the big underlying causes of the problem, then, you know, I, I think we should you know, we should all be thinking very critically about what's the most powerful way to get to the underlying causes. So I think that way of thinking is really important. At the same time, I think we need to have an appreciation of the, the kind of entrepreneurial journey. Um, I read a book not several years ago called Little Bets. Um, and in fact, the author sent it to me and said, I know this doesn't describe your journey, but it describes every other entrepreneur's journey I've ever met. And, you know, he tells the stories in this book about Steve Jobs and, I mean, truly the great entrepreneurs and how they would start these, like they would start something, but then their real contribution was 
many, many evolutions later, right? So it was like little bets, like they'd start something, but then they'd just keep learning. And like the entrepreneurial journey is about constantly learning and, and getting to the higher thing. So I'm reading this book and he had said, this doesn't describe your journey because he's like, you had the big idea from minute one. And, but as I read the book, I was like, this describes our journey to AT, like 100%. Because, I mean, I had a notion and I, I had an idea that that was going to have a long-term impact. Um, but how it was going to do that, you know, I, I think I couldn't have quite understood. I mean, I, I learned so much alongside so many others through this journey about the actual nature of the problem, the reason that this idea that we had actually was having the kind of impact, how to grow the impact over time. Um, so I think we need to all operate with an appreciation for that. I mean, I've met so many incredible social entrepreneurs who start with a theory of change that I might think is, you know, not going to fully change the world, who 10 years later I'm realizing, wow, like those folks are making a massive difference. Not because of what their original theory of change was, because, but because of how they had learned and evolved over time. Relationships are so foundational to life and success and, um, you know, and also provide, I mean, growth opportunities for everyone in, in that picture. So I guess I think we need to embrace that challenge for what we can learn about ourselves and about how to better work with others and about how to be, you know, stronger and more inclusive leaders. Um, that can all sound really great, but it's also really challenging to get through some of these things. And ultimately, um, I do think we need to be clear about, I guess, our vision and purpose and, you know, these organizations don't have to be for everyone and, and people really need to, you know, ask themselves, each person, you know, what their values and purpose and highest contribution can be. And either sometimes that'll be working together in, in one pursuit and, and sometimes it may require people going in different directions. I've found that coaching is invaluable, by the way. I mean, I, I discovered a relationship coach a few years ago who has worked with some of the most incredible entrepreneurs in the world, actually Steve Jobs being one of them, in like the very challenging relationships within their organizations. And I've personally learned so much from her about the kind of self-awareness um, that it takes to, to really work constructively with folks who, who may have divergent approaches and, and ways of thinking. I, I would say, actually, th um, some of the work of this coach, it didn't necessarily solve the issues. Um, you know, and, and again, some people, you know, sometimes you just need to go your different ways. Um, but it did lead me to understand a lot about myself and also you know, it, it definitely led to an evolution in the way I think and operate. Um, I think one of the biggest dimensions of that evolution was around, I mean, I had kind of really embraced this idea around, you know, and a value around the importance of consensus. Like, I was just constantly, and I think maybe because of the early years of Teach for America, you know, had internalized this idea that alignment is so important, like we need to all be aligned in pursuit of the same mission with the same priorities and the same values. And I had built a really consensus-oriented organization which would prioritize arriving at consensus over speed. Um, and, you know, it seemed like such a, to me, that seemed like the most inclusive possible way of operating. Like, so we would step back to figure out what's the strategic plan and engage in a year long process that involved hundreds of people and considered everything to the nth degree. And I mean, it, I, I never even considered a different way of operating. It felt like anything else wouldn't be, you know, kind of inclusive of all the different ways of thinking. But I've really evolved my thinking and approach on this to think actually consensus isn't isn't important um, necessarily. Like we need to make sure that it's clear who needs to make what decision and that we fully consider all the different divergent points of view uh, and then empower the folks closest to the issue, whether it's me in some case or someone else on our team in other cases, to make the best possible decision in their judgment. And 
Um, ultimately, people then make their own choices about whether they want to be part of an effort or not, you know. Um, and, and what I've seen is that actually people feel more included um, when they aren't, you know, sort of forced into consensus. Because you never have true full alignment. You know, it's better to kind of embrace the reality of divergent points of view and be clear that we're making this choice for X reason. We know there are different views, but in pursuit of, you know, speed and entrepreneurialism, um, and in fact, embracing the diversity of our views, we're gonna progress in this other way. The reason I'm a little bit hesitant as I answer this question is that I have seen so many unintended consequences come from um, choices around measuring impact. And I've come to realize that almost any single measure will certainly have unintended consequences. Um, so I guess I, I do believe it's important to measure and look at data and all of that, but I think what's most important is to try to figure out how to not lead people to get so obsessed with those metrics that they lose sight of the spirit and the actual intention um, and, and intended impact. So I think we need to try to keep all of that in balance. And it's, it's led me to, you know, I think about parts of the Teach for America journey, for example, where we went down a path of investing so many millions of dollars and hours and energy on measuring impact. And in retrospect, if we had spent all that energy on building culture and building kind of strategic clarity about what we were all trying to accomplish, I think we would have accelerated impact more. So I think we just need a real balance. And, and I think the donors who have these requirements around measurement and such also ideally will have the experiences that lead them to understand how challenging it is to get that balance between strategic clarity and clear purpose and, and intended outcomes and, and values with the kind of measurement system so that, so that they're not forcing us into things that, that lead us away from what we're all trying to actually accomplish. One specific example, and, and maybe a couple of different things to say on this. I mean, one specific example that pops to mind is that I think it was about our 10th year, and we realized that we had developed such a machine around fundraising and that we were kind of much less rigorous, actually, on on our programmatic side. And, and our assessment was it's so easy to measure fundraising. So we had all of these regional offices raising money and we could just keep running the reports about which office was doing the best and what they were doing differently. And I mean, it was just a total machine that was you know beautiful. So we thought, okay, let's create that on the programmatic side. And we put together a task force of our most thoughtful and good people and they ended up spending a few months and they developed this new system. Um, so we decided that, you know, we wanted all of our teachers to move their kids forward a year and a half's worth of progress in a year's time. Like from everything that that task force learned, our most successful teachers were doing that. And so we thought we should try to support all of them to do that. And so that became the thing. Okay, so three years later, you walk around classrooms thousands of them, and almost every classroom you would go into, you would realize that, that these teachers were driving at 1.5 years of progress. So you'd go into an 11th grade classroom where the kids are coming in, kind of reading on the seventh grade level, and this teacher is trying to move their kids one and a half years forward. So they're gonna graduate from high school a year later, and the big goal is to get them to the eighth grade reading level. And you would just ask them, now, why do you set this goal of 1.5? It's like, well, that's what Teach for America told me to do. It's like, no, 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 no. That's the aggregate measure of progress. Like on average, we want our teachers to move their kids forward one and a half years of progress. But you should be asking yourself, given where your kids are, given what's in front of them, what are you working on with your kids? Don't just mindlessly set 1.5. Like it led to this mindlessness and it was a pervasive 
situation, you know, and, and honestly, over and over, that's one example, but I cannot tell you how many times I've seen things like that. The other thing I would just say is, you know, the, like this work of ours across the Teach for All network is such a long-term endeavor. And, you know, there are many donors who cannot fund things that don't have measurable, scaled impact within three years. So, um, you know, and yet, in my mind, the most important investments we could make are those that generate local capacity to continuously improve and solve problems over time. So the vast majority of philanthropic resources, though, are tied up in foundations that actually couldn't fund this stuff because you can't point to quantifiable, massive results within three years. So I, I just think we need to always consider, again, the actual outcomes that we're trying to achieve and make sure that our measurement requirements are not creating a lot of unintended outcomes. First of all, I'm inspired by the social entrepreneurs across the Teach for All network. Um, you know, I don't think I ever could have predicted 10 years ago when we launched into the work of Teach for All that, um, you know, I wouldn't have predicted that, you know, I'd been through such a learning journey with Teach for America and you start like you're kind of in your own bubble and it feels like, you know, we're, we've learned so much. Um, and I guess what I've seen over the last decade is, you know, there are other people pursuing the same exact idea in ways that are contextualized to very different, both contexts, like very diverse cultural contexts and also to the different strengths of their particular leaders. Um, and so to see what, you know, Shaheen who founded Teach for India is doing, or Najin who founded Anse Poiti in, in Haiti is doing, um, or, you know, what Yusuke is doing here in, in Japan, you know, they've, they've each really added so much to my initial conception of what was possible and what was important and have, have, I think, contributed so much to everyone's impact across the network. So that, that's one thing I would say. Um, you know, there are, I don't know, even just in our own realm of working to take on this very systemic issue of, you know, ensuring educational opportunity for all, um, there are just so many different folks who, whose entrepreneurship inspires me. I'll just mention a couple maybe. Um, you know, I've started meeting people in the last few years who, whose core belief is that parents need to drive the revolution and that actually fostering the leadership of parents in the most, you know, the lowest income, the most marginalized communities so that they are fighting for the rights of their kids and pushing on the system to change is, is the way to really accelerate progress. And I've seen examples of that effort that are truly stunning in their impact. In my own country where, you know, there are urban areas where the politics of education were in an absolute logjam. Like despite some of the most visionary political leaders I know, no progress was being made. You know, where the parent initiative to foster parent demand, um, has actually just totally changed everything. Public perception, the way people are voting, what's possible for these political leaders to do. Um, and, you know, you go from there all the way to, you know, India, where a Teach for India alum has, you know, built alongside many others a movement to educate parents about accessing their rights to a quality education for their kids that's reached already, you know, millions of kids. Um, so that's just one of many examples, um, but there, there are so many important social enterprises that I think are kind of putting the world on a different trajectory in, in a way. You know, what I've learned in the last 30 years of this work is that it is actually possible to solve these problems that, that seem to many to be very intractable. Um, so, you know, I think many people view the fact that there are these incredible disparities in the opportunities facing kids as something that, you know, it's just kind of the way it is. What I've learned is that 
we could actually solve this. I mean, we could solve it in all of our lifetimes. The only question is whether enough talented and committed people will decide to channel their energy against that issue. Um, and I remember hearing Muhammad Yunus when he won the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, his speech was around how he's learned that poverty is a solvable problem. And it was so striking to me because I thought, huh, I've learned that educational inequity is a solvable problem. So I guess I just think, you know, as all of the folks out there are contemplating what to do with their time and energy, I mean, that's the most important choice each of us have to make. Like, where should we put our time and energy? Um, I hope you'll just recognize um, that, that the world's inequities um, really are solvable and, and try to figure out where you can put your strengths to bear um, to make a meaningful difference um, to ensuring that we grow our collective welfare in, in the course of our lifetimes. Yeah.